Hey everybody, this is Brent in Central Arkansas. Today I was out in my garden and I saw a couple zucchinis, my first fruit of the year. And it got me to thinking about something that I can show you again. I had mentioned this probably a few years back in a video, but I think it's good and timely to mention this now because a lot of people are um, starting to get fruits in from squash and you may or may not have pollinators Plus it gives me a chance to show you how I cross pollinate and self pollinate squash. Not only squash, other cucurbits like uh, cucumber, watermelon, and cantaloupe. So let's get into it. First, I wanna show you my two zucchini. These are awesome. And it helps me remember to tell you uh, something you may not know. A lot of people know, but some don't, um, that the more you pick the fruit, immature fruit of zucchini and yellow squash, uh, that's what they're eating for, is immature fruit. Winter squash you let grow uh, until full maturity and the vine starts to die off. But for summer squash, we want to pick them early as possible, yet as fruitful as possible for us so that the plant will continue to make. If you let them grow too big, like this one's a little bigger than this one, once you get up a good bit bigger than this one, what happens is the plant is signaled that it has set fruit and it'll start um, not, not uh, growing the little immature baby fruits. And so when you pick them, they're like, dang, that something happened to that one, I'm gonna continue to grow it. So it's very important to pick the fruit when it's younger. Now the ideal time that I found to pick them is when they are, um, let me show you with my hand, when they are about six inches long, maybe seven inches. If you really uh, want the small ones, maybe five inches. But my hand from here to almost the tip of my hand, I measured it, is about six inches. So I can just take a fruit before I cut it, just hold my hand up next to it um, in the plant and I can tell if that fruit is ready to grow, I mean ready to harvest. So I pick them when they're about six inches long like this. This plant has both flowers on it and it's ideal to show you the difference between the flowers. Now this is true on all cucurbits, all the ones I mentioned, melon, watermelon, cucumber, and squash, both winter and summer. A male flower looks like this fully open it's got more or less a point on the end of it and that point is covered in pollen you can tell it's a male because there's no baby fruit behind it now I'm gonna pull this because we're gonna pollinate that one behind it that's what it looks like when I pull it I'm gonna put this down for a second and I'm gonna show you the female uh, let's see if we can what's the best way to do it now the female if you look here it's got a fairly big actually uh, fruit on it and that's a baby fruit if this doesn't get pollinated on the inside what happens is this will this will wilt this afternoon and this will not grow and it'll wither up that brings up a point that um, I need to discuss with you it's very important to pollinate in the morning Usually when the flower opens, say from about 6 to 7 a.m. to no longer than 11, 12 o'clock. I wouldn't go past 11. Because what happens in cucurbits, all of them, is by early afternoon these flowers start to wilt and this female is not as receptive. And the flowers let you know that because they begin to close up and get all wilty. They're not pretty and pristine like this. By the way, you can eat these. So let me carry over to the other side and we'll get in close and I'll show you me hand pollinating them. Now I'm not breeding this particular squash. I'm just hand pollinating because we don't have any bees out here yet. And so um, I'm hand pollinating so that we'll have the fruit to eat. So let's get over there and, um, and um, pollinate this bad boy. I found one that's on the end of the garden here of the raised bed and I think it's a really good example but it's the same thing it's the same uh, cultivar of my Madison's cross it's got the baby on it and it's got the big open flower now if you look inside here this particular cucurbit has a big um, I don't know what you call it a uh, 
it's not a, I guess you'd call it a pistol. Uh, I can't remember on squash. I think that's what it's called also. I know on tomato. Anyway, so I take the male flower here. And what I do is I make a what I call a pollination ghost. And it's just a little humorous thing. And I take and I tear it down both sides and I cross it over like this. It gives me something comfortable to grab a hold of. I do this with squash, with um, melons, watermelons, and um, count, or, uh, cucumber. I don't do this because they don't have that big of leaves. I just tear them off. But I'll show you that too. So I take the flower here and I'll try to bring it closer to you. And I've got all this male with all that pollen on it. And I rub it on here like this. And you can see the grains transfer. It become, You see these little, well, it's pollen. And they're all over the end of that. Now, if I have lots of flowers, I'll do this prob female probably an, another time. But this will definitely do it. One time is all that's needed, provided that this one has a good bit of pollen on it. Because I'm not getting pollinators... Um, I don't have to worry about the pollen being stolen by bees. Let me see if I can get a little bit on my finger here. But if, I, if there are bees out, I would have to protect this to make sure it gets pollinated. And that's especially true if I'm breeding or, or selfing or crossing uh, the squash. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. And there's a way to protect the fruit. It's called bagging that makes sure that uh, and uh, pollinators like bees and others can't get to the fruit and pollinate with something you don't want to pollinate with. This one has two. This particular one here doesn't have any pollen on it. It happens occasionally. Went a lot of fruit on, or a lot of pollen on that one, so I'm going to take another male since I don't have any other females to pollen I'll do the same thing I'll put that one down make my little pollination ghost cutesy name and we'll go back over to this one I'll pollinate this little lady and I say little lady because this is the female flower as naughty as this may seem, this, this is awesome and it produces the fruit that we love to eat. This fruit here is one I pollinated yesterday or day before, probably a day before. It's already starting to grow nicely, even though the flower isn't completely wilted off. Beautiful. I love this squash. Now this is a vining squash here. This is a cross of mine. I cross Feroce Delicat, uh, with, which is a breeding of mine, with Winter Luxury Pie. And I've got these round fruits here. And this baby has got a nice, big, beautiful flower on it. And down here you'll see that I've got a male. So I'm going to take this male flower. It's growing out of the bottom here. Look how big that thing is, but compared to my hand, it's wider than my hand. It's a gorgeous example. And if you look close, you can see the pollen is shedding even onto the sides. It's also on this. Now I'm going to make the ghost so you can see it a little clearer in the sunlight. Let me get the... See if you 
can see that better. Yeah, it's better if I do it this way, probably. We've got some shadows casting. Anyway, I'm going to go around to the other side over there, and we'll pollinate that one. All right, now on this one, I got the male flower here from the same plant as the female. So you know they're going to be compatible. Now the next one I'm going to show you is a different type of squash. It's a winter squash, and it's a butternut. Now this squash, and the first one I showed you, Masson's Cross, is from the species C. Peppo, P-E-P-O. And it is a different species to the next one I'm going to show you, which is a butternut. And that one is C. period Machata. M-O-S-C-H-A-T-A, I believe is how you spell it. They're completely different species, and they will hardly ever, ever cross. In fact, I don't know of any that have ever been able to cross it without some kind of bridge species. That's a whole different story. Toss that. Um, there's a male here, but there's no other female on that other plant. So let me take you over to the butternut and show you. Now this plant right here that has this male on this male flower here, I'll go ahead and pull it because it's only going to be good to today, early at this afternoon. And we'll make the pollination ghost out of it. I don't think we'll use it unless I find another one. This plant, oh, I accidentally pulled the tip off, but that's not a problem. So this plant here is a Maxima. It will not cross with the butternut machata, and it will not cross with a... Um, see Peppo. Uh, here's another male flower that'll be open in a couple days. You know it's going to open when it turns yellow and it's still closed like that. You know it's going to open the next day. But this squash uh, male flower will not pollinate. Let me bring you up and over. This is its fruit. This is a kabacha, a C. maxima kabacha. And I've got a white tag on it here meaning that I selped it. I use white to remember that it's pure. In other words, it's the same male flower. I used a male flower off the same plant or same variety and, and pollinated this one. And it's a neat little round squash. Next to it, right here, you can see the butternut squash right here. It's got the familiar shape on it and it's got the flower. Now, something unusual about this is I could take this and pollinate it. It may grow, but the seed will not develop within it. It'll be sterile or the seed will not um, develop at all within that squash. So these two species are different. You've got a round one, Maxima, and a butternut shaped um, Machata, C. Machata. I hope that leaf's not too distracting for you. So I've got to find a use for this one. Hopefully I can find another kabacha, the plant I pulled this from, that we can pollinate with. We've got another one here I selfed. And there's a, another one right here I selfed. It's got the little tag with the white on it. And then up here, here's one I did yesterday or the day before as well. It's got the little selft on it. And these things are already across the top trellis, part of the trellis here and growing really long every single day. But there's no open female flowers. This is another one I have on the end that's a butternut. And this one is gonna close and that won't get fertilized because I haven't had any male flowers yet. Now this squash here, right here is female. I'm gonna pollinate that in just a second. You can tell that um, it is a typical type uh, yellow summer squash. Early prolific looks like this. It's got the little lines in it, and it's kind of a different kind of yellow. When they're small, like this one, they're greenish in color. And then when they get bigger, see, see that color there? When they get bigger, they turn more yellow. So um, I wanted to show you um, I'm going to take a Madison's Cross here, which is next to it. I'm going to pull the summer 
it off, sacrificing it because it didn't get pollinated. But this is Madison's Cross, and Madison's Cross contains what's called the bee gene. So even when the squash is really tiny, it's super yellow. And I will show you that in just a minute, but look how yellow it is compared to this one. Now I'm crossing this one with this one to create a hybrid. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I've crossed Madison's Cross this one in the past, and I know that it imparts most of its qualities. But when I cross these two different species, they're highly inbred, what that does is it creates hybrid vigor. And hybrid vigor is awesome. So I want to capture hybrid vigor and most of Madison's cross um, qualities, characteristics. Now let me show you a difference real quick between these two. Put that one down here. So take a look at this one. And then a baby one over here. See if you can get that in there. Where's my finger? See how yellow that is? It's so yellow, a lot of times the uh, fruit itself is not only yellow, but a large uh, a portion of the stem going into the base of the um, stem here, base of the plant, will be yellow as well. It's got that bee gene. What bee gene does for a squash, besides make it look prettier and bright and shiny, is it helps with disease. It's called greening disease, I guess. Um, and it's that's a virus. And these Madison's Cross doesn't get that um, greening disease because of the bee gene that makes it this bright yellow color. Now it's scrumptious. This squash right here tastes much better than this squash. In fact, this yellow squash tastes much better than any yellow squash I've ever had. And so I want to get those qualities and then bring out some hybrid vigor. So I'm back here and at the this particular yellow squash. It's a highly inbred squash. And I'm going to cross it to Madison's Cross. So I walked over to the other raised bed and I got another male here. We're going to make a pollination ghost. And the process is exactly the same. I'm going to take it and I'm going to rub it on to the female parts here and transfer the pollen. That's it. Now this one's going to start growing. Now what I do with these is a little bit different. If I cross it, let me get the rest of the pollen off of here. If I cross it, I want to identify that that's the one that's crossed. So I make it a different color. I use the same thing I used when I said I selfed, but I add yellow here. And the yellow indicates that it's cross. If I don't know what I'm crossing it with, then I will write the pollen donor, the, the parent, the male of this particular squash. And I'll know what this one is because it's the female, it's the one with the fruit. So I'll know that I crossed this squash with whatever this one is. This one was Madison's Cross. This squash I'm only crossing with Madison's Cross, so I don't need to write the name on there. You can see the yellow, excuse me, I kicked the camera pod, tripod. You can see the yellow and the white here, along with my tomato clips. That, if, I, if it was a self-pollination, one I wanted to keep that was selfed to the same plant, or the same cultivar or variety, I would use white. In this case, what I just showed you was a cross. So I just take a piece of this tape, it's actually plastic. Flagging tape maybe, I don't know what it is. I found it online, a bunch of different colors for really inexpensive. And I take normally this tomato clip where it grabs string and I put this in between it just like so and I hold it like this. Now I will take it to the squash and I'll clamp it around the baby squash and that holds the tape in place. So I'll show you that. All right, I've got my clip here. I'm gonna take this leaf and see if I can kind of get it out of the way of the camera shot. Make sure you can see it here. And what I do is I put it around the base of the squash like so. I just clamp it on like that. That way, when this gets bigger, the tomato clip won't be able to come off. And the wind won't mess with it at all. It'll just sit there until it's harvest time. 
Some squash, like the kabacha, will make a big stem and uh, where it connects to the fruit. So you might have to put it, like I did, on a side leaf over here just next to it. That way it'll signal when you go to harvest it. Keep that because it's a cross or, or keep that because it was uh, selfed or crossed back to itself, which I call selfing. So this is a good zucchini to show you. This is the ideal size right here. It's delicate. It's long enough. Excuse me. And I'm going to take and cut this. I could rip it, twist it just like this, which I'll go ahead and do. But I prefer to cut them because I don't want any damage here. Also looking at this plant here, you can see a yellow where I crossed this one with the zucchini next to it. Even behind it, yellow indicates cross-pollinated. Also behind it is a nice male flower. We're going to make a pollination ghost with it. Well, we're going to instead tear all the flower off because it accidentally came off. And so you can do it this way too, so you got a nice pointy pollen filled, is it pistol? I think is what it is. I keep forgetting the dang uh, scientific names. So this is the other kind of zucchini I'm crossing with it. And this zucchini doesn't exist today. You can't get the zucchini anymore. But I've been saving seed. So this is a lighter colored zucchini. It's highly inbred, meaning it's open pollinated. And I'm taking the male from the other zucchini. Even though this is a cross, I'm not going to keep this one. I'm keeping the fruit from the other zucchini and I'm taking the flowers off of this one, the male flowers. And I've already, as you just saw, I've made that one plus another one that's crossed with it. So this one's a little lighter color. I'm going to do a taste test between the two and just uh, check out the differences. But anyway, I'm a hopeful for a beautiful cross. Now in my container, I keep these little creamer containers because they make ec excellent storage. In here, I've got organza bags. And organza bags are a wonderful tool to bag the flowers. And bagging the flowers will keep the pollinators off of the flowers so that um, I can ensure that what I do is not um, taken or stolen from me, my efforts, by a pollinator and as a breeder that's very important to me um, if you are hand pollinating it's also very important if you want to make sure that you can definitely hand pollinate something uh, because the bees will go in early in the morning they'll be all over the place hopefully you have bees right now I don't have any but um, the bees will go in there and they'll take the end of that flower, that male flower, and they will strip all that pollen off and you will have no pollen whatsoever to pollinate what you're trying to pollinate, the squash you're trying to pollinate. Now hopefully they did it for you if your only interest is to eat that squash. But to make sure that you pollinate or hand pollinate so that you know that the squash that you pollinate is um, the one that you actually want to eat then using a bag is definitely beneficial uh, but for me the organza bag is a wonderful tool as a breeder to make sure that 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 cross i just showed you where i'm crossing madison's cross to the other yellow squash uh, happens the way i want it to i'm not doing it right now because no pollinators are out the pollen would have been stolen otherwise but I'm going to show you how I do it like in the main garden out there, the main lazy garden, or when bees are all over the place. And so to do that, you have to pollinate, or you have to bag, excuse me, both the male flower and the female flower. Let me show you how it operates. I was about to turn the camera off. You take and you pull these, like you put this over the squash, like this. And then you pull the two sides together like this and it locks that flower into the bag. It's got such small hose that there's no way the pollinator is going to get in there. And this is used for like organza bags are used for like holding wedding rice and small amounts of jewelry and 
all kinds of weird crafty stuff but in the gardening world it's becoming more useful for bagging flowers for pollination and also there's bigger ones like in this ziplock bag here that are really big and you can put it over tomatoes or other fruit to keep the pests from getting into the fruit and pecking the fruit and um, like some have little these little uh, mouth parts that go into the fruit and they'll begin to damage the fruit so let me take you and show you bagging one of the flowers all right we're around noon and you can see already that this male flower was fully open this morning but it's already starting to wilt it's starting to bend here and wilt and um yeah the the in another hour or two this pollen won't be good anymore uh surely the female won't um, be receptive to it by this time probably 2 p.m uh, so it's better to pollinate like i said in the morning just to make sure to maximize your chance so this one is pretty much had it now i could probably use that today for something if i had a female that was ready to take pollen next to it is a male you can see here it looks like a spear and they come to a point like this before they open now this one is got a little bit of green in it i'm not quite sure because sometimes this happens i'm not quite sure if it's going to open tomorrow morning or the next day but in either case i'm going to bag it if it's not open tomorrow then it'll be open the next day and i can use it then so what i do is i take the organza bag i put it over just like that and it slipped right off <laughs> and i grab the two sides just pull them together don't have to be too hard and that right there secures that flower it's going to attempt to open um, it is going to open and you can tell it won't be fully spread out like this but it'll be inside the bag just waiting to be freed and as soon as you take this off that flower will pop wide pop open wide so with males you don't have to be too careful they're pretty hardy females when you bag them you got to be a little bit more delicate because you could pull the baby off or pull the end of the flower off of the uh, baby fruit we're back at madison's cross here and you can see this particular fruit right here it's got a yellow tip the same as the male but on a female flower because it has a baby that one's a little yellower i know for a fact this one's going to open tomorrow so we're going to slip the bag on it bring it down to the base and pull it tight just like that now when i say tight i don't mean strangling tight i just mean tight enough to be more or less a seal turn this bag where you can see it a little better And that's what a bagged female looks like. Bring you in closer. Kind of cool. I'm going to take that off. I'll just leave it on. It'll be fine to do. Even though I don't have any pollinators, I'll just leave it on. All right, it is the next day here. And you can tell that this squash is, is trying to open. So let's free it. Pull on either side of this bag here. You want to kind of be careful because you can break it off. So pull it gently. All right, that's freed up. Now I'm going to go ahead and help it open a little bit because we're going to pollinate it. Now this is a fantastic specimen for saving your seed because you bagged it yesterday or i did you can and you know that no bee has gotten to that because you had a bag on it now you can take a male from the same exact plant or the plant next to it if it's the same variety like i did and you can pollinate it this way you know for sure 
that the seed that's going to grow or be in this baby squash eventually when it matures you're going to save it till it fully matures and that's usually about I would say 45 to 60 days after pollination typically it can depend on the variety so I did that I I have definitely pollinated this now in order to protect it from bees coming in after I pollinate it in fact a lot of times when I'm pollinating the dang bees are trying to get to it uh, while I'm doing it so I have to kind of shoo them off but in order to make sure that they don't pollinate it I, because it can get pollinated twice by two different species two different um, plants uh, and one may be a zucchini which you don't want or something else you don't want so to make sure that doesn't happen you need to rebag it so getting this back together like this and putting the bag on can be a bit of a chore you can rubber band it or string it or something like that but I bought these little bitty um, clothes pins just for this purpose and so what you can do is you can pinch it together like that with string or tape or anything and that'll help get the bag back on now some people say that you can tape this and pollinators won't get in it but I'm here to tell you that I have seen pollinators finagle their way inside maybe not bees but other pollinators so let's put the bag back on again you have to do it carefully and gently just like so and then you recinch it back down now in this case it's not all the way at the base because of the flower but that's fine as long as it's cinched down along the smallest part of the squash here and now then I'll come back in a couple days once this there's no chance that the the little baby squash will receive pollen anymore because it knows it's been pollinated and I will take this bag off and it'll grow and you'll ensure that you have pure seed to save now I'm not concerned about this one because I'm going to eat it so that's why I'm taking this back off so we're out here at the cucumber now and you can see we've got some nice fully open male flowers there's no baby on the back of it so we're going to take one of these so that we can pollinate I'll take two so that we can pollinate the squat or the uh, cucumber next to it now the flowers I just took off here are from a monaceous uh, cucumber meaning it produces male and females and so a lot of times with monaceous not always they have to you have to pollinate the female with a male flower in some cucumbers they're gynaceous and gynaceous means that every single flower coming up is a female it always has a baby cucumber on it and this is emerald sweet of mine it always has a female on it there's no male flowers and it doesn't need a pollinator because it's also parthenocarpic and parthenocarpic like my tomatoes i was showing or talking about many times over the year is uh has the capability to set fruit without being pollinated and that's what parthenocarpy does it's a great great tool to a great great plant to have that is both parthenocarpic and gynaceous because every fruit that grows or starts growing will continue to grow to maturity and they will have uh, seeds that are undeveloped in them um, all plants have seeds in them it's just uh, whether or not the ovules is what they are whether or not they get pollinated is another thing and when the ovules get pollinated they grow a little bigger they get hard and they can they contain the genetic material for the next generation a gynaceous parthenocarpic will have no seeds so you can't save the seed from it so let me set up the camera here and i'll pollinate this one from the other bet alpha just to show you how to do it okay i think we've got the flower in there now i'm going to take one of these males 
And I'm gonna do essentially the same thing I did with the pollination goes, except I'm not going to keep the flower petals because this little part here that has the, the pollen on it in the male flower is very tiny in cucumber. And I'm not gonna go out and into the garden uh, because I'm not sure that I've got male, I don't, I'm not sure I've got female flowers on the melons and watermelons yet. Well, I'll go out and take a look at it just for you, but uh, the process is exactly the same. The, the same tiny male flowers and the same, the, the flowers are about the same size for both male and female. The only difference, instead of a cucumber on the back of it, it'll be like a small watermelon or a small cantaloupe. So anyway, you just take that, you strip the petals from around it so you are only got the pointy thing, and then you take in the flower and you just point it at it and just kind of rub it around just like that. You can twist it and that will almost assuredly, that right there, that one application right there is all that's needed. Now this should start drawing tomorrow. I'm not sure if I'll put the video up or show this, but I got another male. This one's a little smaller flower or a little smaller tip here. So it's likely not to have as much pollen on it. Now with these, my eyes are not good enough to see the pollen, but I've done this so many times, I know it works. Works great, actually. Let me see if I got another male within reach here. I do, and uh, they're starting to uh, kind of fold up here. You see how it's not open like this one? starting to fold up here and some varieties will, will quit if you will give up the ghost sooner than others so anyway I took it and I'll just dabble that on as well you can even leave it in there like that it won't hurt anything so that's it for cucumber let's go ahead and take a walk out to the garden and see what the melons look like here's my watermelon and this watermelon is a breeding of mine in order to i'm trying to develop a really tiny seeded watermelon where the seed is closer to a tomato size seed instead of a regular watermelon seed you can see they're vining and i even have a male here i don't see a female yet so we're not going to be able to do that but you can tell by that last flower here and this one too that I'll just go ahead and take it off it's not useful it's essentially similar very similar to the cucumber male flower so going over here to cantaloupes here this is cantaloupe cream it's another breeding of mine and cantaloupe cream doesn't have any flowers on it either it's got a male and again it looks very close to the cucumber so we go along here and you can see my camera's cutting off the batteries low but you can see that there are no babies I'm starting to put them on the trellis all right that'll pretty much conclude this video i do want to end by summarizing the main points taking my breeding out of, out of the equation here. Um, if you don't have pollinators and you want to ensure that you have fruit to eat, you need to hand pollinate. Hand pollinate is important. Um, to, it, it's important to do in the morning. I target around 9 a.m. If you go, I mean, the, the blooms will open at 6.30, 7 a.m., but a lot of times there's dew or moisture and that will uh, sit on the in the flower because the flower is kind of facing up a lot of times and it'll just kind of sit in water if it's wet it's not as effective so I give a couple hours after they first open uh, plus it allows me to sleep in a little bit have some coffee and then I come out about 9 to 10 a.m. and that's when I do the majority of the pollinating now as a breeder I do it every day uh, bagging and that sort of thing like you've seen in the video um, so that brings me to bagging bagging is very important if you want to make sure that that squash gets pollinated the specific one you want because if you have bees the bees will take the 
pollen from um, males and they may pollinate things. They may pollinate squash that you don't want to uh, have pollinated or something else and that leaves you with a flower that a female flower that won't grow for you. Uh, so that's that's important to bag. Um, organza bags work fantastic. Um, they cinch and they uncinch really easily and it's just overall awesome. Um, hand pollinating is not difficult. You want to be gentle with the female flower that's got the fruit on it because a lot of times what will happen is that the in the middle of the female flower that little uh, I think it's called the the um, stamen in there that can break off or the the stamen with the all the flower itself can break off so what I do kind of is I you may have seen it in the video is I attempt to grab the base of the squash a little bit with my palm and kind of hold the flower steady like that and then I gently do it like like I should see there the male flower you don't have to worry about they're really hardy the only thing you have to worry about with a male is if you manhandle it too much you're tossing pollen everywhere so that's less pollen to put on the other plant so that's pretty much it um, you got some insight into me crossbreeding I talk about that a little bit the importance of bagging for cross pollinating and self pollinating uh, self pollinating is just as important as cross pollinating because self pollinating will ensure that you have the right seed year to year. And that's something else for you guys. Um, if you're interested in saving the seed and you want to make sure that you're saving the seed from one particular variety or one particular plant, you have to bag if you're growing other squash of the same species. For example, if you're going to yellow summer squash, either early prolific or a patty pan or anything like that, and you're also growing zucchini, those will easily cross pollinate. So if you don't bag the flower, you don't know what you're gonna get. And by the time they reach this size, it's not a good idea to find out that time because you may get a squash that's not to your liking. And then again, you may get one that's great. Who knows, that's all fun of breeding. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe, like it, because that gets the algorithm going in my favor. It shows it to more people. Uh, I'm not growing as fast as I'd like. And uh, most of all, if you want to comment any which way, negative, positive, whatever, I don't take offense. I leave all comments up. Just drop them in the comments below. I'll answer them even if they're nasty I'll answer them and usually not get nasty back because there's a lot of Superman on the internet you know what I mean people that act brave uh, when you can't see them <laughs> and this they'll say some really crude stuff thankfully most of you aren't like that and if you want to comment I'd appreciate it I'll answer your comments about the things that I do I'm not an expert in gardening all the way around but I do know a lot of good stuff so if you would, please like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video. How long do we gotta stay? Say